we have discussed the origins of dark matter and the fact that to date no one has ever detected it. There are three alternative concepts that could explain the galaxy rotation problem without the need for dark matter. Let's dive in and find out more. Our first observations of galaxies showed them to be quite isolated from each other in space. We had expected these galaxies to have an inverse square gravitational field, meaning that as you move further from the centre, the rotation should slow down. At the centre of the galaxy, we do indeed see a good correlation to the inverse square law. But as we move a little further out, this changes, meaning the orbital velocities stay constant as we move further out. Dark matter was invented to add additional mass around the galaxy to account for this discrepancy. Later observations showed that galaxies were not isolated in space, but rather strung together on filaments. Don Scott considered that the galactic rotation problem could be solved by considering the radial electric fields of the filaments that the galaxies reside in, but this does present some problems that might not at first be obvious. Don Scott's model of a Bessel function Birkeland current demonstrates that the material inside these forms into concentric shells. This is due to the fact that the magnetic field changes as you move further from the axis of the Birkeland current, and this would mean that some of the material would flow in the forwards direction, and as you move further out from the axis, this would change to a rotation around the axis, and if you kept moving further out, this would eventually lead to a reverse flow and this pattern would keep repeating. At the same time, the amount of material would steadily decrease with the highest being near the centre. In order to solve the galaxy rotation problem, Don instead focuses on the radial electric field in the filaments. This was based on the idea that the charge density is at its most concentrated towards the centre of the filament, and steadily drops off. This creates a linear uniformly decreasing voltage profile, and means that as you move further out, the voltage would steadily drop. I have previously covered the concept and some of the outstanding issues. The link to it will be in the description below. In order to solve the galaxy rotation problem, we now need to have the material being attracted inwards only by the electric field, and no longer following the concentric shell model. The problem is that from Don's original paper, it is not clear if he modelled his Bessel function on an iron-only stream or a mixed electron and ion stream. Most plasmas should contain both. In which case the net charge should be close to zero, so there would be no radial electric field. If we assume that it is predominantly an ion flow, then it should be obvious that the charge density would indeed be highest at the centre. But now the problem is that this becomes a point of repulsion, not attraction. Maybe I'm missing something in his explanation here, as I don't see how both concentric shells and the radial electric field could be true. If we add Marklin convection into the equation, it becomes even more complex, as now the material should bunch at each of the shells, leading to discrete jumps, not a uniform electric field. Marklin convection also requires both electrons and ions to work. If we examine the rotation curve for this model, where the material follows the electric field, we do find it is a better match compared to gravity only with no dark matter. Now, Anthony Peratt had a slightly different concept of how galaxies might form in a plasma universe. Here, two filaments essentially twist together, and at the closest point, a double layer forms which causes the material to be collected there. As the two filaments continue to twist around each other, their motion creates the spiral arms of the galaxies, and the central bulge is where the matter is compressed the most. If you are interested in understanding this model in more detail, I would suggest looking at the series I produced on these, which will be linked down in the description below. Peratt was happy that at some stage gravity would start to take over, but he never modelled this component in his simulations. Could this model account for the difference between the central bulge and the arms of the spiral galaxy? Now there are still many open questions that this concept has, which I have covered in a separate video which I will also link below. But what if the answer was much simpler than all of this? Jim Weninger pointed out the following concept. When we consider the gravitational field of a galaxy due to its symmetry, we can consider that there is a centre of mass towards which the field will point at any point away from it. 
Filaments are very different and are long, thin structures that stretch for millions of light years. There is no center of mass as this is distributed across the entire length of the filament. Instead, it is a line of mass. If we move away far enough, then it will start to approximate a point mass. What we need to consider is that the galaxies are embedded within these filaments. Traditionally, it has been convenient to consider space empty. The space in between galaxies is ignored, as it pales into insignificance compared to the density of a galaxy. The problem is that these filaments form the backbone that created the galaxies. They are still there, and this very low density, almost undetectable matter stretches for millions of light years. The gravitational field of this matter in the cylinder has been ignored. Let's just consider the gravitational field of only the mass in the cylinder. We can imagine that the cylinder is sufficiently long that we do not have to worry about either end. Now imagine that we are at the center of the filament. At this point we would feel an equal attraction from the mass above, below and from each side. The net result would be a cancelling out of all the forces. This means at the center of the filament the gravitational forces from the filament do not act. If we move slightly off axis, we see that there is no real change to the forces from the masses above and below, but when we examine the difference from one side of the filament to the other, we can see that there is now slightly less material on the left and slightly more material on the right. The net result is that we feel a force back towards the center. As we move further out, this net inward force will slowly grow until it reaches a maximum at the edge of the cylinder. This is the opposite to what you would expect if you are moving away from a body where the field falls off with an inverse square law. Assuming the galaxies form close to the center of the filament, the highest concentration of matter would be at the center. The mass from the filament would also cancel out from each direction, leaving an inverse square law. As we move further out from the center, the central concentration of mass falls off quickly and we are off axis from the filament, meaning we would experience an increased pull from the filament on the opposite side of the central bulge. The effect of this is that no matter how much mass is concentrated in a galaxy, and no matter how low the density of the filament, at some distance the gravitational field must go from an inverse square law to an inverse law. Now there are some important considerations from this idea. The material in the filament would feel an attraction towards the central axis of the filament. So we require some force to stop this inward motion, otherwise you would end up with all the matter concentrated in long strings. The simplest way to achieve this would be through rotation of the material in the filament, similar to how galaxies work. Of course, if this material in the filament was plasma, we would instead need to consider the repulsive forces of the charges, as well as the longer range attractive forces that created the filament in the first place, through the movement of the plasma. Here another consideration might be Don Scott's Bessel function model, as the concentric shells might act as confinement areas for some of this material. So could a combination of these provide an alternative explanation for the existence of dark matter? If we examine galaxy rotation curves, you will notice when we examine the one for our Milky Way, there appear to be bumps as it appears to speed up and then slow down. This might be explained by considering that Marklin convection would cause material to bunch together creating higher density rings as you move further out, thereby altering the mass profile and hence the gravitational field of the galaxy, causing parts to rotate slower and faster. Indeed evidence of this might be found in how the chemical composition of stars changes as we move further out from the galactic center. The distribution of dark matter that is needed on the galactic scale to explain the rotation problem means that we cannot have much of it here in our local neighborhood. And this means that we cannot use it to explain stellar rotation. And yet they do. The Gould Belt is a ring of stars that are centered on the Pleiades. I've discussed this as part of the procession series. Currently, astronomers struggle to explain its formation but one of the leading theories was that a large dark matter clump impacted a giant molecular cloud forming a ring of stars. The inferred motion of the stars would seem to indicate that they are orbiting a common centre, which does not have enough mass. In Jim Wenninger's concept, the local chimney and the ghoul belt 
are formed as part of a singular event, when the local Birkeland current underwent a pinching event at the galactic plane and pulled in the surrounding material and then explosively ejected it outwards in a torus. Then we have the dwarf galaxy problem, also known as the missing satellite problem. This arises from a mismatch between the observed dwarf galaxy number and their simulations. In these simulations, the dark matter clusters hierarchically, in ever-increasing number of halos. As an example, our Milky Way has 11 dwarf galaxies, and yet the simulations had predicted that there should be around 500. And herein lies another problem with dark matter. On a single scale, it can be used to explain any type of rotation. The problem is that you cannot take it out of that scale, and yet this is exactly what is being done. Consider this, if you are trying to get funding for dark matter detectors, where are you going to propose that this dark matter is to be found? Yes, that is right, here in the solar system, where we don't even seem to have any breakdown in the inverse square law. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time. <laughs>